Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Quinn. I'm the Director of Technology Integration for the Menden Upton Regional School District. And this is the February edition of the MURSD Leads Author Interview Series. Our guest tonight is the co-author of Intention, Critical, Creative in the, Critical Creativity in the Classroom, Dan Ryder. Dan is a veteran educator and is now the Education Director at the Success and Innovation Center at the Mount Blue Campus in Maine. He's also the co-founder of the education blog and consultancy, Wicked Decent Learning. On Twitter, you can often find him leading and dropping knowledge and a, foom, and a few boom shakalakas during EdChat ME and the DTK12 chat. In addition to being an outstanding educator, presenter, and author, he's also a member of the Teacher's Lounge Mafia Improv. Dan, welcome to the show. I've been a fan for a very, very long time. Hey, thanks, Dave. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. <laughs> this mutual admiration society in effect tonight. <laughs> so this is great. Joining me tonight on the panel are some of my most creative colleagues and also uh, some of my co-presenters from the EdTech Teacher Fall Conference where we met Dan. Uh, first from Misco Hill Middle School, an art educator and design thinking extraordinaire, Alice Gentili. Alice, how are you tonight? I'm muted, aren't I? Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Hello, Alice. Good evening, Alice. I'm awesome. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dave. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Hi, Alice. <laughs> and next, we have two teachers from our Mendon Upton Spanish Immersion Program. First is a second grade teacher and the MURSD Spanish Immersion Coordinator, Katie Cardamon. Katie, how are you? Good. Good. Happy to be here. Hello, Katie. Hi, Dan. <laughs> And joining her is uh, her third grade counterpart, and to my knowledge, the only Division One athlete on the panel, unless some of you have something to tell me. Palmer. No? Palmer, <laughs> what? No. Uh, a, a fellow uh, URI, fellow Rhodey Ram, yep. uh, Olivia Hendricks. Olivia, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. Hey, Olivia. Hi there. All right. I feel like I'm on. Wait, wait, don't tell me. Like I'm saying <laughs> hi to all the panelists. I'm just calling in. What game are we going to play? Whose voice can I get on my message? I thought, did you write the limericks? <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote zero limericks. I, I, I don't play. My limerick game is weak. Weak. <laughs> Division <laughs> three. <laughs> Division three limerick style. <laughs> Uh, Dan, I'm going to get us started with a question that we've been asking all of our participants uh, this year. In our district, we've been exploring the idea of inspired learning or learning opportunities that have made a lasting impact on people. What would you say is your most inspiring or memorable learning experience your time, during your time either as a K-12 student or during your teaching career? Oh, this is such a great question, uh, and I love to answer it. It's uh, in eighth grade, I had a teacher named Rich Kimball. And uh, you may know him as the voice of Maine Black Bear football. You may know him as an actor extraordinaire uh, in the Bangor area, Bangor Brewer area of Maine. And you may also know him as the host of Downtown with Rich Kimball every afternoon at 4 o'clock uh, on the radios uh, up in Maine. Uh, but he was my English teacher and social studies teacher in eighth grade. It was his first year of teaching. And he took the dumpy, nerdy kid in his class and treated him like a human. He treated me just like I was like everybody else. He talked with me, he joked with me, he knew that I liked the Twilight Zone and sports and all these, like he knew that I had all these varied interests, that I was a pretty like dynamically interested and intellectually curious kid, but that when it came to socializing, I had zero game, zero skills. And, um, but he, he talked with me like, not like a peer, um, he talked to me like uh, a teacher who had a really invested interest in his student and uh, wanted his student to feel welcome. He joked with me, um, he called me on my crap when I was being a dingus, which was often, um, but he was just, he was just, he was fully present when he talked with me. And that just has fueled me for a long time. I kind of knew I want to be a teacher, um, like prior to that, like I had the idea, maybe um, I really want to be a comic book artist, but let's get real. Um, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and I had really good teachers all all through elementary school. But but Rich um, just was that person that I needed in that time. Um, and what's been really cool is since then, 
uh, he has become a friend and uh, he still teaches up in Brewer, uh, but he has an improv group and I've performed with him. My improv group has performed with his improv group. We go up every year to the festival they throw and we, we perform together. Um, so he's kind of a, co he's a colleague and a peer and it's just, it's been a really cool uh, journey and experience to have uh, alongside him uh, in a way while still totally distant. But I don't, there's not a day I don't think about something that happened uh, when I was in his class that just made me feel connected and valued. And it's something I try to bring to the table each day when I go, well, it'd be easier not to talk to this kid because I got things I got to do. Uh, but now we're playing DC Deck Builder this afternoon and I'm teaching a kid how to play a game. And that's the kind of thing that Rich would do with me. And uh, it means a lot. You know what's really interesting about your your story, Dan, is that like the content never comes up in any of it. It's all about the human interpersonal relationships. And it kind of reminded me of what Connie Owl said about content just being a context for learning. Would you agree with that? Is that kind of how you would frame the experience or was the, the content a, a critical piece of your experience with this teacher? Um, with Rich, the content uh, couldn't be a critical piece because he's kind of terrible at teaching content to be. <laughs> Honest. He was. He just was. He would admit it. He did not. I, I, I remember very little social studies that I learned from him or almost anything to do with English. Uh, we, we, we performed songs as poetry. That was neat. Um, but it really was the relationship, though. And that's what I needed in eighth grade. I didn't need to be full, full of content. Uh, I got plenty of content in high school. I had great high school teachers. Because Rich made me feel comfortable in my own skin at least as much as any eighth grader can, who's like overweight, not cool, has the wrong haircut, doesn't listen to the right music, as much as any of those kids can. Uh, he made me feel comfortable enough that I could advocate for myself or I could kind of meet the teachers that were coming next in my journey. Uh, like, I felt like I had value and worth being in their classes. And that wasn't something that I went into eighth grade feeling a lot of um, by my peer group. So um, it was it was really important. So I, I don't want to discount content. I think content is important. Um, but I think the reason why I had good content teachers later was because we started in a good place with relationship. And I'll, I guarantee you the, the best content I, I learned uh, was because I had great relationships with the teachers I had, uh, whether it was uh, Mrs. Christakos in, in uh, English, uh, not English language arts, but creative writing, or Mrs. Jones, who I had for two years in high school English, um, who I had a great relationship with and was like the first one to kick my butt about like, you can write better than this. This is a D minus. <laughs> and just was like, do it again. Nope, not good enough. Um, uh, and then even into the other subject areas, not just English, uh, social studies, Miss, oh my God, Jim Smith. Like he taught me so much uh, uh, history. And I remember the history he taught me. But it's because we had a relationship, and I remember his storytelling, and I remember just loving how he how he taught history. Um, but it was because I could we had a rapport, and, and it was like a running every history lesson was like a running joke between him and I. So I think content is is important. Um, I was just thinking about this the other day, and I realized I'm a bit of a ramble, but I had a, I had a thought about content while I was out for my jog the other day, which is if we think content is king. And we think content is super important. Are we really honoring our content if the way in which we deliver it is in the way that students are least likely to remember it? So I just want people like, as we as we dig into the stuff from the book and the ideas today, just think about that. If you are feel like, oh, the, the best way to get this out was just put it on the table. Um, ask if that's really how the students are best learning it. Because if it's not the way they're best learning it, are you really honoring your content? Thanks, Dan. That was a really long answer to a really simple question. So, apologies. Also, this is just Diet Coke. For <laughs> anybody who can only see that it's a can and is wondering what I'm doing, even though Maine's microbrew industry is amazing, and I have many recommendations if you would like them later, um, this is just Diet Coke to keep me awake through the day and because my body is 90% saccharin at this point. So. <laughs> So, Dan, the recurring and perhaps defining phrase of this book is rigorous whimsy. How would you define this concept to those who are new to the idea? So rigorous whimsy 
is uh, the, the term Amy and I came up with to describe the idea that learning can be both really deep and meaningful and ridiculously silly and fun at the same time. You do not have to sacrifice one to benefit from the other. Um, a lot of people feel like we can do, we're going to do a creative thing and now we're going to get serious and do the work. The two things can happen at the same time that you can, you can play and uh, explore ridiculousness and try out there things in the context of actually knowing the thing you're supposed to know. In fact, I, I find it uh, frustrating when you walk into a classroom, and they're like, why are you watching the movie? Oh my God, because it's the best. Talladega Nights is so good. <laughs> like, there's no, re like, why are you watching that in a math classroom? Well, we're just having a down day. We're just having a down day. I'm like, that's silly. Like, if you want to use Talladega Nights for math assignments, we can figure out a way to do this. Like, this isn't hard. Like, we could come up with a thousand sayings that they're going to say every time they go around the lap track, right? We're going to take Shake and Bake, and we're going to change it up, and we're going to have new sayings that they're saying, that, you know, that, that, that Bobby is saying every time that all relate to the math we're learning, right? Like, why not? Like, let's do something. And not... Then watch two hours of Talladega Nights. Yeah. Watch eight minutes of it. Laugh your faces off. And then take something from that and put it into use. That's rigorous whimsy. The idea that we want deep, meaningful content. We want deeper learning happening. And we want to have fun while we're doing it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Keep them coming. Throw them at me. What else we got? I'm on a roll. All right, I'm up. Alice. Um, hello. Break it. <laughs> so, um, Dan, I was thrilled to read your book. Um, being an art educator, creativity feels like it comes really naturally to me and my colleagues in the field. And so, my question is actually um, kind of related to art education. And it all comes together in the end, you know? Right. Oh, so, totally. <laughs> totally. So a frequent discussion amongst, amongst we art educators is whether or not showing exemplars prior to initiating a project. Yes. You want me to keep going? No, keep going, keep going, it's a great question. <laughs> I've seen the, to, to the folks at home, I don't know if you can tell, but we're reading these questions because they, I, I haven't got set up answers. I just got to see the questions ahead of time. So <laughs> this is great though, it's good. This is a great question, I love this one. Okay. And you're letting people see behind the curtain. If they can't have they, a lot of smoke and mirrors. Dave, <laughs> Dave, the smoke and mirrors like evaporated in the intro, my friend. Like oh I hate breaking God. it to you, but people could tell. I could oh see the God. eyes on television. It was like watching a Saturday Night Live episode. You were so reading the cue cards. Uh, <laughs> so we'll talk with me later. We'll work on some techniques. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> wow. All right. So Give you a hard time. <laughs> Back to exemplars. Back to, back to exemplars. <laughs> okay. Um, so is it helpful? Are they helpful in establishing guidelines or hurtful as they may stifle creativity? Art educators' opinions about this vary depending on the project and medium. Within the book, the Catalog of Creativity shares specific exercises and activities to engage student creativity. Do you have an opinion about whether or not one should share exemplars prior to initiating these exercises in the catalog of creativity. Yes. Please share. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I could say like, oh, this is the right answer. Um, my opinion is very much it depends. And I think it very much depends on the students that you're working with. Um, I think there are students I think we have the technology and the capacity to say to students, would you like to see an example? And would you not like to see an example? Like, what's going to help you? Some students hit the panic button, right? They go, I have no idea, I, I've got nothing. I, this is impossible, right? And you go, hold on, hold on, it's very possible. For example, right? And then you have the other students who are like, as soon as you show them something, you know they're just going to regenerate whatever you show them. 
because they want to check off the boxes and they want to make sure they get everything right because there's a right way and a wrong way and the right way is whatever way the teacher showed you to do it, right? And then you have the other kids that, is, that need to just have freedom to explore and try. So I've been chastised before for not giving students exemplars. And I go, this is low stakes. However they come up with the response is fine. Like whatever they try to do, it may not be what I envisioned and I have to be okay with that. I have to be like, I didn't show you how to do it and that's what you came up with. And is it, does it honor the criteria I gave them? Does it honor the constraints provided? That's what we call them creative constraints, right? You stay inside of this little box that might be this big or this big, depending on the experience and how many, how many constraints you've given them. Um, but the, you like it's as long as you are have the mindset as the educator that it's okay whatever they come up with, then it's okay whatever they come up with, um, and you have to you, you you can't penalize them for that. Um, at the same time, you have to know your students, and if you have a very concrete learner who is just going to sit there and do nothing because they are in atrophy mode, right? They're the creative atrophy. I can't. I don't. I don't. Hey, here's one thing that someone did. Let me show you how they did it. Now, now, what I want you to do is make something similar. But if you make the same thing, <laughs> like I'm gonna be super irritated with you. So don't make the exact same thing. Find your own picture, find your own quote. You know, we use it a lot, potent quotables is a good example. When I assign that, kids go, wait, what? <laughs> like I go, you've all had the internet. You've all seen a meme. They're, you know, you've all seen text attached to an image. I'm just asking you to make something that looks more like a Pinterest image than like something you know you see coming across on uh, you know on uh, you know snapchatty what's it's and who's it's um right so i really think it depends and we try to give examples because we know we get feedback from teachers saying i have no idea what you're talking about but if you go through there some of our more abstract things we didn't provide examples for Kind of on purpose, hence the name of the book. Like, because it can be weird and it could be something else. And we want people to reach out and ask us, well, what would that look like? And we say, um, it could look like a lot of things. So um, I know it's a, it's a debate. I struggled with it all my years as an English teacher. And um, I, what I've learned though is find out about my kids as soon as I can so I know who needs them and who doesn't. Well, thank you. That was a good answer. Thanks. <laughs> I'm meeting the standards so far. I hope so. I've insulted the host. Oh. I've been very kind to the panelists. <laughs> Winning team. Exceeding, exceeding. <laughs> uh, so I have a question now. Okay. I'll try to make it look like I'm not reading it, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm paid. Make it look exactly like you're reading it. Like the <laughs> most, like, if we could only, there it is. <laughs> um, on pages 13 through 16, you provide an overview of your creativity credo. Which of these beliefs seems to resonate with your readers most and which seems to challenge their thinking on the topic? Oh, such a good question. Um, and this was one that I did not prep my brain for, which I wish I had. Um, we haven't heard back from anyone saying like, ugh, that one. Um, Amy really shaped the credo the most. Um, I, like I definitely was a part of it, but a lot of that came from her thinking because she lives and breathes those things like in her day-to-day -day life. Um, because the book really is a hybrid of our two, of our two minds really like gelling and, and, you know, to use the lexicon of the book of uh, mashing it up. Right. Um, the one that speaks to me the most on a day to day basis is creativity and cr uh, craves constraints. Like that's, that's the one that for me, um, if there's one thing that I think is an easy one to take away, it's like when we tell kids, I want you to go make anything and you can do anything. And it's this project on the book. Like you sign a book project, right? You sign them. You're, you've got, you've got kids in Spanish, right? 
and you've got some primary text, to, right? So that you're like primary text, not meaning primary sources, but we've got primary level, right? Spanish texts. And you're reading this this little storybook and you say, make any project that shows anything you know about the book. And they sit there and go, huh. Yeah. Naturally, you know, some kids are naturally going to make things, and then you realize that all they did was recreate the cover, or the, some other kid makes something. And you're like, "What is that?" And they're like, "I don't know. What were, you, what were we supposed to do?" And you're like, "I'm so um, and, and and that actually that one is there. Um, Amy and I were talking, and she shared a story about her mom saying that the worst thing that a the worst thing that a parent can do is is give their kids complete and total freedom. Because it's the greatest jail that they could be in. They yeah. don't. It's a prison for kids to not have any sense of direction. Um, they get rudderless really quickly. And I work with adolescents, and it's like immediate if they don't have a sense of what to do. Um, and I wish I could say I knew this all along, but it's totally something I had to learn as an educator, um, and something I still stumble on. But, you know, like oh crap, I forgot to give them creative constraints. Um, so that's the one that I think is the most important. Um, the one that I think people struggle with is, is the first one, um, which is creativity is a debt. Well, not the first one. Creativity is a birthright. That one is one of those ones. that's like, everybody's creative. We hear that a lot. That's like on the, on the thing. Um, but creativity is, a, is a Tao, um, is a way of being, um, a lot of people like because it's referencing you know an eastern philosophy people are like wait what and what we try to say is i, I try to reframe it as creativity is a mindset right if you go in with a with a with a creative mindset and you approach problem solving as a place that there's more than one answer if you think of it as a path as you're going to climb on board this path and you're going to follow that pathway where it takes you and it's going to help you get to where you want to go because you're going to believe in yourself and believe in that it can get you there, you're going to be okay. Right? So first you have to believe that you are creative. That's the birthright. But then you have to believe in the power of creativity to solve problems. And that's the Tao. And so that's the one where I get a little, not so much pushback, but more like, uh, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. How's that for, does that, does that help wrap your head around that, that answer, that question? <laughs> Yes, no, it definitely, it definitely does. So the constraints bring out the creativity in some ways. I'm still wrapping my head around it, but. Yeah, no, well, yes. So the, so, so the create, the creative constraint, right? When you say, let's, let's use some real, like, let's use. So going back to those kids and the picture book, right? If you say, I'm going to provide you this, um, I'm going to give you an iPad with um, notes on it, right? Like Apple Notes is on it. So that's one thing sitting here on the table. And I'm going to give you 14 Lego bricks, and that's sitting here on the table. And then I'm going to give you um, one set of watercolor paints, like just like one of those Crayola, you know, eight-color watercolor sets, right? And a stack of watercolor paper. That's all, um, and by the way, this watercolor paper is all in like, a, let's say a five by five square, right? You say, those are your three options. You need to make a brand new cover that doesn't look anything like the cover on the book right now. Because the publisher has said they want to put on a new copy of this book, but so many people didn't like the cover, nobody read it. <laughs> and we want everyone to read it. So you need to make a cover that's going to get everybody to read it. The constraint is you have to use one of these three tools to do it, okay? And you have 20 minutes. So you've got to do the best job you can in 20 minutes. Now, here's the other thing I'm looking for. By the way, let's get rigorous whimsy about it, right? Because just recreate the cover. Hooray, great. Gallery of covers, so much art. Love art for art's sake, Alice. I'm with you on art. <laughs> Huge fan. My room is full of comic book, nerdy, geeky art all over the walls. It's all... These are all commissions from different artists of different characters. I love, I love art. Okay, um, but we're talking about trying to like layer everything into a classroom, right? To make every every minute kind of extra valuable, and then yeah. then we can like breathe and be like, yes, now art for art's sake, time, right? So then you say, and it needs to show, 
you need it when you when you make that that cover it needs to show one of the most important ideas in the book so maybe it needs to illustrate the biggest conflict in the book or maybe it needs to illustrate the lesson that the student learned or what you, you can kind of pick within that you could brainstorm as a class what are some of the things that might be on the cover boom 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 awesome now you've got a menu of topics to pick from i'm going to illustrate this this or this you've got a menu of choices to make about which which you're going to build in right so you've got choice for students who need choice you've got limits constraints for students who need limits and constraints you put a time constraint on it so you you've lowered your own like expectations in terms of hey you only had 20 minutes look how awesome it is instead of i gave you six weeks six <laughs> weeks these third graders had six weeks to make this cover and look what you gave me look it's it's terrible it's, it's just it's a mush what is this is that supposed to be the mona lisa it looks terrible like i don't know what like but we all do that right we give kids kids need more time they don't especially high school kids they don't they don't need more time they need three weeks they need two weekends three weeks max don't make it like assign a project three weeks in and out move on like time like not move on but you know what i mean like don't like if you yeah. if you give them five weeks guess how long they're working on it three days beforehand if you're lucky right give them two weekends so that they can plan their lives and that sort of thing but for the smaller kids voice and choice all the time and then set that set that goal of what you want what you really want them to show that they know yeah does that help like yes see the, like, the, yeah. the constraint how the constraints work yeah right? and then you, I love that example too I love right? that example. use it go for it take it <laughs> we'll do <laughs> we'll do thank you and then send me pictures of them because i want to see them because i think i will really yeah <laughs> Dan, before I get into my next question, um, do you ever do you ever find yourself giving extensions to those constraints? Because the one thing I'm thinking about too is you've got this the creative constraints, you know, help prevent like the paralysis by analysis and that that three day window uh, really can tackle it anyway. Yep. But at the end of the day, the, it's not like this is like summer camp where if it doesn't get done or if it stinks or if it's a low grade. You know, th there's consequences in terms of you know we're also in the college admissions process to a certain extent, and I'm coming back to what? the college admissions process. I'm not familiar. Not familiar? Oh, that okay. Sounds, that sounds neat. Hey. <laughs> um, of those. But how do you how do you deal with the real consequences of time yeah. constraints? And do you give extensions, or is it just kind of the the way it is? So I don't call them extensions. Okay. Um, for one, uh, learning is the constant. Time is the variable. Right. So when I'm working with adolescent students who are need to learn such things as time, we do things like um, one, I operate in a proficiency based environment as much as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So you will not lose any points on the grade for the learning that you're creating and demonstrating. However, you also get a score that's reported in a, in a separate way on your work ethic and your ability to stay on top of things. So this is how our school is working now. It's how I've been operating for several years mm -hmm. um, in various ways. Um, I just had to keep changing my, my methodology to suit the grade book. Um, but what, the way I look at it is um, you give them that constraint. Student isn't meeting that constraint. I talk to them constantly about communicate with me. Let me know ahead of time. Are you going to meet this? If you are not, Let's come up with a plan for when when you are, um, because most places, including in college, um, including college admissions, are OK with you as long as there's an open line of communication. It's not the last minute. Right. We all have things go wrong in our lives and most people are human um, and they we have great conversations and we we empathize with one another and we've been there and we have compassion and. I think we often forget when we're working with adolescent students that that is a truth that every adult benefits from every day. And for some reason, the real world that we refer to constantly when working with adolescent students, that compassion doesn't exist. Everybody, you're going to lose your job. You will never get hired because you're always late. You can't turn things in late. Yes, you can, but you have to deal with the real world consequences of whatever whatever that means for that context. 
I know which bills I can pay late. I know which ones get a finance charge. I know which one, like, we have to teach them how to navigate that. We can't just, like, you know, set them free and hope that they figure it out. Mm -hmm. That's why you talk, like, having a conversation, having a relationship. Hey, which teacher allows you to turn stuff in late? Which one does not? Mm. Right? And, okay, what happens when that, like, what are the consequences? What are the things? You have that conversation with a student. If we build rapport, then when you say to them, like, so what's going on? Well, I haven't turned anything in for math. That's probably problematic because I know you're a math teacher. And even though they'll still accept it, they're going to hold it against you. They shouldn't, but they do. Right? Or I know your science teacher. They're not even going to notice you didn't turn it in yet. Because they don't get to that pile of stuff for another three days and you're fine. So, like, just communicate with them. Um, but there's always room to expand the time constraint. Always room. I just find that when I don't give one right out the gate, mm -hmm. it's too wild, wild west for almost. I, I haven't met a kid yet who's like, oh, it just ruined everything that you told me when it was due. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like even the most cre creatives. Hey, I'm a creative. I, I do stuff. My, my deadlines are often performance dates. Like the show's yeah. going up, baby. We have to have a set list. Like I can't just sit around and think about it. Like we have to do it. So. So Dan, the, the education landscape's not uh, lacking for metaphors on what learning is like. <laughs> um, but I, I, you use one that I, I hadn't heard before, but I think is apt in terms of skateboarding, which I don't think many people think of learning like skateboarding. And I think it ties it well into a lot of the choice options you've talked about. Can you expand, can you talk a little bit about that learning as skateboarding metaphor and expand upon it a little bit? Yeah, I can try because that's actually Amy's metaphor oh. that she loves. Um, so, so you can, what I love though, is that you're like, so Dan, you write about it. That means we got one voice in the yeah. book, yeah. yay. I mean, when I read it, I can totally tell like the parts Amy wrote and the parts I wrote, but I love when it's like blendy um, and other people don't know. It's wonderful. <laughs> it makes me giddy. Um, that's I, that, and it's also our friend Sean Zebarth, um, who's an amazing English teacher in California. Um, super good dude. He's Mr. Zebarth on the Twitters, and I highly recommend engaging with him because uh, he's just a super good dude. Um, but, uh, uh, and that's him, him skating, because he still skates to this day. Uh, but the metaphor, the, the idea um, behind skating is, like, in order to skate, skate well, um, you got to start with the basics, right? You like, you can't just jump on and do every trick, right? So you got to learn how to do the basics, ride the board. But then when skaters get to a place where they've learned the basics and they've learned the tricks, that's when they start doing really cool stuff like, what if I took this trick and combined it with this trick? And what if I took that trick over there and I did this? And what if I ollied and then, then I went to a nose grind and then like, right. So they start mixing and matching different tricks. And that's where I think the, the metaphor plays nicely with creativity in the classroom. Like, okay, I'm already doing this and this works well. And I'm doing this and this works well. So what if I took these two and smash them together? An example from my classroom. I was teaching kids how to analyze movie trailers. That was going really, really well. Like they were getting like how a movie trailer compels you to watch a film. That was going, that was going great. And then at the same time, uh, I was teaching them about symbolism and theme and some other things. And I was like, wait a minute. What if that, like, and, and well, and that was going well, and, and we were getting into the book, and I said, what if we make not, instead of making movies of the book, right, everyone's like, make a movie. No, don't make a whole movie. Just make a trailer. Make a trailer for the whole movie. So I had my students make trailers if they actually made a complete movie adaptation of XYZ thing. What will we watch in just the trailer? What will we see just in that? And show me that you understand how to persuade and convince right but do it through digital media do it through digital storytelling and visual storytelling do it in creative medium you can make it any genre you want you want to convince people to go and see your movie so you're working in kind of a real world context practical application uh, persuasive uh, digital media you got all these different buckets you're fulfilling i also require that they use symbolism in it that has to be very evident to me as a hint at the themes then when they 
prov- turn it in. They don't. I don't at, have to sit there and try to figure out what they meant. They need to do an analysis. They explain their trailer, how they did the thing that they did, which is just like a DVD comment- commentary track, right? And then so that was like this hybrid of a few different types of of activities. Um, when I teach, I used to teach Hamlet to AP students, and what I'd have them do is instead of creating. Um, you know, a lot of times it'll be like act out the scene or do do the do the play in a different context, right? I just had them create a film of just well, they had to imagine the complete film, but I only wanted them to record the to be or not to be part. That's it. So imagine if you were just skipped ahead on your DVD or you streamed ahead, whatever you know, whatever your preferred thing is. I like VCRs, so it's like. Imagine if you held down the fast forward button and you got up to that point where the to be or not to be speech is and you just watch that part. That's the only part I want you to turn in. It's the only part I want you to make. But I want you to have conceptualized the whole rest and explain it. Right? So I'm taking like that idea of making a trailer, like instead of making a trailer, which they've already kind of done and might have explored another class of mine, we're going to do over this idea of just taking a piece. And that, that all loops back to the skateboarding idea of all right, I'm going to do, I know how to do, you know, uh, oh, an indie twist. And now I'm going to take that. I'm going to do a, I'm going to turn that into a McTwist. But instead of just doing a McTwist, I'm going to do a, like a backslide at the end of it. And then that's going to go into, you know, a, a grind of some sort. And everybody's like, right now, the entire audience is be like, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. Fun fact, neither do I. That was just things I said that I remember from Tony Hawk Skateboarding 4. Like, that's, that's, I just, like, because I'm not a skater. I've never been one. But that's the idea. It's just remixing tricks and discovering new things and innovating um, new ideas. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. I love being a verbal processor on the internet. It's so <laughs> helpful. Hopefully it makes for compelling listening when you're in the car and you're like, why is that guy talking with his hand so much? <laughs> it helps, helps us understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I have another question, which I, I kind of think you might have already answered, but I'll ask it. Um, since in your book, you mention a lot of Google resources, but you don't mention the 20% time. And right. Is this something you answered because you don't see it as having enough creative constraint or would it be something you would adapt for your classroom, use a different name or just not something new? So I'm really glad you asked the question. Uh, and I was super happy when I saw it on the list uh, because the reason why we didn't include it in there is because Google has managed to co-op 20% time and somehow they invented it. It was actually 3M that really started 20% time. And uh, Google has, beca- has, has, has famoused it, but it was uh, the company 3M responsible for the post-it note um, yeah. and, and, a bu- and scotch tape and all kinds of other really cool stuff, right? Yeah. Um, 3M were really the innovators. Uh, and, and some argue that even goes back before that, that maybe Bell Labs was doing stuff with it um, be- before that. But 3M is the – 3M, all my readings and stuff bring me back to 3M as being kind of the originators. So part of it is it's not attributable to Google and Google gets enough credit for all the other Googling. Um, so that's one reason. I actually like 20% time. I think it works fine. Why? Because 20% is your constraint. Okay. Like, right? Like, yeah. we're, you don't get it all day. We're not just wild, wild westing. I got to stop using that cliche. We're not just doing whatever we want to do here in the classroom, yeah. which I tried. I tried a, I, I, I tried a self-paced class. Uh, experiment. It was a beautiful fail up. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Beautiful disaster. Um, that that was great for some kids and terrible for most. Um, but we learned so much, and I've I've uh, applied it constantly. All the lessons I learned from that. But twenty percent time. That's your constraint. Like it's right there in the name, right? Yeah. So so I like twenty percent time. I like genius hour, right? You have that hour. What I don't like is the idea that, well, I gave you an hour this week to do inquiry-based learning, so that's all we're doing. Like, whoa, hold on, wait. Yeah. You can do like, here, here's your hour of 
pursue whatever passion like is really driving you today. And you're going to get like, today's that hour, you know, you have in the week where all bets are off. It could, it doesn't have to be something you've worked on for six weeks in a row. It can just be the, of the moment. What's the thing you want to dive into of the moment right now? If it touches something else, great. If it doesn't, no. I think that's cool. Um, but I, I, I think uh, the danger of genius hour isn't genius hour. The danger of genius hour is how you apply it to saying, this is the only time during the week when you're going to have any voice, any choice, any, any sense of, of having your, your hand on the rudder as the student is just as one hour a week. Everything else is going to be prescribed to you. Uh, and we're not going to do any other inquiry work. Um, and that's where I think 20% time and genius hour get, get misapplied. Because that's not the, their intent. Their intent is to give room for mind-blowing ideas that then inform the whole and make you go, oh, that's really good. We should do that. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's, those are my feelings on 20% time. Thank you. Yeah. So I totally get that. Um, I have the next question for you, Dan. Um, this is about, so, so your book to me um, as an art educator, it just really presents kind of a great example of how arts integration can be authentic and how we can all, and all of us in our silos and subject areas can be working together to create some really dynamic curriculum. So um, I, think, I think every teacher would want to participate in this. I wonder though about the pressure on teachers, whether external or internal, um, does it make sense to develop this kind of creativity-based curriculum as a shared task through a few different perspectives? And from your own experience in preparing to write this book with Amy, <laughs> um, can you share advice on how to best do this work together? And also, I mean, I think about our, in, in most of um, the public, public schools in our country, there are schedules that people live and die by. And um, a lot of times, in my opinion, they become kind of a blockade to any, any wonderful collaboration. So I'm just wondering if you can advise us how, um, how to best do this kind of work. And if you can share with us examples of successful programs where this work is done well. So it's hard, it's hard. if you make it hard. And what I mean by that is, um, do you remember Mr. Rogers? You remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? There's this great episode where uh, this guy tells this story about a bubble and about a bubble being trouble. And if you treat a bubble like trouble, it's trouble. But if you treat a bubble like a bubble, it's just a bubble. Does anyone else remember this or is it might be only one who's old? I know. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I remember I was raised by my TV as a babysitter. It was fantastic. I've learned so much and it's all imprinted. Um, but that's the way I look at a lot of things and a lot of problems that we run into in school is if we see them as trouble, then they're trouble. But if we treat them like a bubble, they're just beautiful and wonderful and they, they're fragile and you can pop them if you need to, or you can let it sit and be glorious and inspire like all the cool colors you see when you look into, the, into a bubble. Um, start small, do something small. Most of the time when I encounter people, and I've been guilty of this so many times, you go, oh, you know what we could do? And you have this amazing conversation, like in a hallway after school, and you're like, oh, yes, 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 yes. And then you all go home and you, you're talking about it, and, you're, and you sit down and you start grading papers, and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I'm never going to be able to do that. <laughs> because it's just so big, and the next day you're both like depressed. Do small things, do really small things. One of the things that we hope with the book is that if you look at the catalog of creativity, you'll see some things that look pretty intense, but you'll see a lot of things that are very small. And there are little things you can do that can have meaningful impact without days and days and months of prep. Um, I referenced earlier um, the uh, 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 potent quotables, right? An easy one to do with a photography, you know, if you're doing photography in your art class, 
right? Or, or you're doing it in your commercial art. We have, a, we have a commercial arts program in our high school and they do photography in there, but we also have a media arts program, a digital media program that focuses more on moving image, but they also do some with photography. It would be really awesome and not hard to take one class period and say, these kids are gonna take photos inspired by the quotes from the text that about whatever subject area, let's say history is history, right? They've, got, they've been looking through all these primary source documents for all these, and they're pulling out all these great quotes. And you're gonna go, all right, you're gonna go take the photos, you're gonna pick the quotes, then you're gonna take your gallery of photos, you're gonna take your gallery of quotes, kids, you're gonna pair up, you're gonna grab two, put them together, put them into, put them into, you know, we have one-to-one -one Mac Airs, so I'm gonna say you put them into Keynote, make a slide, boom, 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 adjust the font, play with the font, be intentional on everything. I want the font choice, creative constraint. Font choice has to enhance the meaning of the potent quotable, right? Any filters you have to do, you have to explain why, you, because then at the end, you're gonna provide me with an intention map. Intention map just says, here's the feature of our design, the thing we made, why we did that, how it proves what we know, what we would do differently later, right? Intention map, boom, 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 boom. One day, 80 minutes in a block schedule, right? You can do that whole thing, soup to nuts. And it could be used as formative assessment to see where their composition skills are for photography. It can be used as reading comprehension uh, and content check for, for the US history side of things. Um, and then you've got collaboration. So if you're doing habits of mind, you can look at, are you a collaborative worker? Um, then you're also checking work ethic. Did you get done within the time constraint? If they didn't, we go, Dave, can we have longer? And Dave goes, yes, of course, because you talked to me about it before. And, and then they come in, then you put up a gallery of them, you throw them on social media, you engage the outside world, respond, what do these things make you think about, right? Like, what ideas does this inspire? Um, where are these sources from, you know? And, but it's small, right? One class period for a complete synergy of two classes, right? But you could even trunk it down from there if you wanted to. We're taking a half an hour. The kids already took the photos, so they brought them in. These are all photos by students. They knew that they were going to be giving them to other students to use for a project. You don't know what they're going to be. You had a half an hour to find a quote from the text that combines the two things, work together with your partner. You, know, you, can, you can shrink that amount of time. And that example I just gave you could do with kids of any age. You just take it, take your first graders out and take a bunch of photos. I've got a six year old myself. He would love to go running around with a camera and like take weird upside down pictures of this, that, and the other. And then the other kids have their text, right? Say their Spanish text and they've got, right? And I want you to pull a good quote that this illustrates. And I want you to pick the right font. Don't pick the font you like, pick the font that works. It does the work, right? Um, but start small, do little things. Um, Cause if you do one little thing, you can build on the next little thing. Right, and then you can build on the next one, the next one, the next one, and each of those successes, you'll find it each time you do it. Oh, okay. Next time, let's try something that's like two days long, and you see the value in it, and that will inspire the everyone to give themselves permission. Which a lot of times we just gotta give ourselves permission, and then we don't see the bubble as trouble. We see it as, yeah, you know, just a bubble, like a Lawrence Welk musical number. Yes, what I might say. <laughs> Again, yeah. I'm like 97 years old, so like almost the, uh, all my references tonight are like from the from the PBS days of yore. I like that you brought it full circle, though, back to the bubble. Good, right? <laughs> yeah, and the way you presented that, um, just just to come come back a little bit, um, you talked about three subjects: so art, um, ELA, and social studies. And so the way my my mind works, I think. Why don't we just take a morning and we take three blocks and we blend them all together and all three teachers work together and we can do this whole project at the same time as a team. And how cool would that be? Oh, it'd be amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? We're not, we're not, it's not, they go from here to here to here to here. They're with all three of us all at the same time. Yep. Right? And we're all working yeah. together. So it's manageable. And be like, this is insane. Where, <laughs> how do we know where they are? You go, because we're professionals and we can keep track of children because we've implanted chips in their brains. <laughs> and we all have the app. Here's where they are. Find my student. 
you know, like it's, uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Right. And then, right. And it, then you get the administrator pushback and that's when you go, okay, how about we just, I'm going to have them for this time. And then we're going to just rotate our kids through the different rooms. Right. Boom, boom, boom. How come there's so many kids in the hall? It's okay. It's okay. We found, we found a parent volunteer to escort them. Right. Like it's fine. There's just a, they're, they're a traffic mover. Like they're going to move every 20 minutes. They're just going to shift around through here. Right. It's going to yep. be okay. We promise. Nothing happening here. Move along. Nothing happening here. We're not disrupting the master schedule. No bells. Don't worry about the bell schedule. It'll be fine. <laughs> Everyone will eat. Everyone eats. Like, thank, thank you, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dan, in the book, you write, direct instruction and guided learning are necessary because that is how we grow our dots in order to make connections. In an elementary classroom where we're with our students for the majority of the time, uh, what would be a good ratio for direct instruction of the dots versus giving students time to connect the dots? For example, creating play, play, or create play or tinker. So I think right now in education, um, and I think for a long time, we've done about 80% direct instruction and 20% dot connecting. And I think we have to do, like, I, I don't usually say this, but I think we do the massive overcorrection the other way. I think we need about 80% dot connecting and 20% direct instruction. And the reason I say that is, if we spent more time with connecting dots, then students are gonna uncover the places where they don't have the dots connected and they're gonna ask questions. And you're gonna say, I know how to help you find that. And then your direct instruction comes from helping them connect a dot, right? Um, Trevor McKenzie has written an amazing book on inquiry called Dive Into Inquiry, and I can't recommend it enough. It's a nice slender volume. It fits, fits well into any bag. You can just kind of keep it and yank it out and like read parts of it to just to kind of like refresh your brain about like how to have an inquiry based classroom or how to use the principles of inquiry to kind of just drive all the things you're doing. I really, really love it. Um, and it, it's, and he's a, he's a, also a great dude. So you can just reach out to him and be like, so Trevor, I was reading your book and I was wondering, and he will be like, yes, let me tell you. He doesn't sound any like that. He's like this really nice Canadian. Um, he has like no like swarmy, like a little gross swagger. He's just a nice dude. Um, as are like all Canadians. Um, but that's, that's what I like to see us do because if we give that just 20 minutes of direct instruction, we focus on them knowing just that thing that we want them to be able to do. And then that other thing, and then them seeing how those contexts go together. Then when they run into a problem, we can, we do have time to say, all right, let's find out. Let's, 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 let's figure that out. And then when nine of them have the same problem, you know what you're going to use your next 20, 20 minutes or your 20% time, right? Like of direct instruction doing, right? But the idea that students are just self-direct, like I don't believe in Summerhill. Like I thought, I think A.S. Neal was like, woo, he had some out there stuff going on. And I uh, just said, I'm not, I'm not with you, buddy. Like uh, I saw the documentary, there was kids throwing stones. They were having a big argument about whether or not it was okay to throw stones at cars. Um, the answer is no, it's not. Like, it's a true story, a true documentary. Look it up, find it. It's fascinating. Um, so I'm not a big fan of, of that. I'm not that kids shouldn't explore their world or answer their own questions in ways. Not, not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when we disregard direct instruction, we do everybody a disservice for the same reason that we need constraints. Right? Like, we all learn somehow. We direct instruct our own. Those of our parents direct instructed our kids how to do certain things. We did it in unique ways that, you know, aren't necessarily how you do things in the classroom, right? But we direct, we gave direct instruction. It's, it's okay and it's important. We, <clears throat> Amy and I both believe really strongly that we shouldn't discount or throw away anything that we know about teaching and learning. That all has a room and a space. We just also believe that creativity is the avenue by which you can do a lot of that work. <clears throat> and we think that it's just an add-on. So many people are of the mindset that it's just additional. It's on top of everything else. What we're saying is, no, 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 no. It's actually the underlayment. It's the foundation upon which you can build everything else, right? And that's what's really going to give you the magic mojo, is if you, if you think of it as creativity as necessary and fundamental, 
Um, and again, we already have it. So it's not like something you have to add in, mm-hmm. but you just change your lens. You just change your perspective on how you approach the process of teaching and learning as from a place of let's use creativity to enhance that understanding and that learning that we know is super important. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So Dan, we're coming up on the end of our time together and, and thank you for being so generous and, and giving us an evening with you. Hey, you let me just talk for like an hour. Are you kidding me? I'll do this every week. (laughs) Dan, so, um, and I think your closing point's a good one because um, Jal Mehta wrote an article for Ed Week talking about like the dangerous myth of like basics before deeper learning and the importance of having both because I think oftentimes, you know, in our school experience, I'm just speaking for myself as a learner, we spend so much time on the basics, we never got to the deeper learning because we were trying to march you know, the slog through the curriculum. Uh, You're supposed to learn about Thanksgiving seven times before you get to high school. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and, and, and the most meaningful learning experiences, at least for me, were the ones where I got to do that deep dive and something that's interesting. Right. Um, I think my closing question for you is, you know, we had such a great experience tonight. What's next on the horizon? I mean, you, you've still got a lot of time with this fantastic book here. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's so pretty, isn't it? I mean, and and all, and I love the intentionality of the black and white. That it, you know, you don't need color to be creative. Um, but what's next on the horizon for you? Where are you presenting next? If we're you're in Massachusetts, where might we be able to cross paths uh, for the folks who want to hear more about your ideas? Well, if you're this weekend, if you are super game, come on up to Farmington. If you're in Massachusetts, you're in Rhode Island, you're in New Hampshire, you're in Maine. Ed Camp Western Maine happens Saturday. It's completely free. We still have spaces available. Uh, come here to Farmington, to our beautiful campus. We're going to have a day of learning, and it's glorious. It's our fourth year. We're super excited about it. Um, so come on up and then ski. Come up Friday night and ski the night away, and then spend the day with us, and we're done at 2, and that's plenty of time. You can go to our local mountain, take a mountain right in town. It's, they've got fantastic skiing. They have snow making. They're wonderful. They're good humans. Um, so come on up for a, for a ski weekend, uh, this weekend. Um, but let's say you don't watch this until after the weekend or you're watching this during Ed Camp. What's your I'm going to be in San Francisco, um, the week of the, uh, let's see, the week that includes the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. Amy and I are presenting at Learning in the Brain, um, conference in San Francisco, talking about the book, but I'm also presenting on improv, uh, in the improviser's mindset and helping with, um, innovation. I'm doing that with my good friend, Ellen Deutscher, who's an amazing human as well. Um, Everyone should follow her on Twitter. Um, And uh, then at the end of that week, the end of our, I think you guys have break at the same time we do, right? Mm -hmm. That week after, after Valentine's week, the end of that week, uh, I'm, I'm going to still be in California. Uh, I'm presenting at uh, design camp Monterey, uh, which is a fantastic event. Um, My, good buddies Caleb and Eric uh, from San Diego have created this amazing network of design camps around the country. And so I'm going to be presenting at that one, uh, talking about design thinking in education um, and probably talking about the book too, because I can't stop. Um, And then uh, Amy and I will both be together at South by Southwest EDU in March. Uh, We'll be presenting on Monday, uh, Monday early afternoon, and then we'll be doing a book signing right after that. Um, they're at South by Southwest EDU. And I think those are the only three on the immediate horizon, but there's some other opportunities coming up, um, bouncing around. I might, I'm looking like I might be at ISTE this year. I wasn't going to be, but now it's looking like I may be. So that's, uh, exciting. Uh, they're with, ed, hopefully they're with EdTech Team Press potentially. And, um, yeah, so. And then just reach out and invite me to things <laughs> because because uh, I like going places and, uh, and I love talking, obviously. Um, but yeah, this is, it's been really exciting to be able to to get the ideas into a book um, and have an amazing co, co-author with Amy. She's like more like a co-conspirator. Um, <laughs> we've been friends for a really good time, a really long time. We have amazing times together. We goof around a ton. Um, and then we were able to put all that goofiness and ridiculousness into a book. And uh, and it's been been super super cool. Well, Dan, it is a fantastic one. Uh, once again, it's intention the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon. 
It's a great read, uh, very resourceful. It comes with activities you can do in your classroom, as Dan said, to start small. Um, we're also having an event in May, May 10th. Dan, love to have you down here at Nipmuc, bringing some okay. people together for some creative learning. Um, so, But again, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you to our incredible panel, Alice, Olivia, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are back on March 8th. We'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Scott McLeod. Uh, we're going to be talking about different schools for different worlds, a little bit of Trudicott and the four shifts. Um, so once again, March 8th at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, for MURSD Leads, I'm Dave Quinn. Good night, everybody.